January 26, 1861. Coyotero Apaches raid the southern Arizona ranch of John Ward and abduct his young son, Felix Ward. The U.S. military demands Chief Cochise of the Chiricahua tribe to release the boy. Cochise honestly replies that he does not have the boy, but Lieutenant Boscom does not believe him. Boscom arrests and holds Cochise's family hostage as ransom for Felix Ward's return. Cochise raids a wagon train, kills the Mexicans, but captures three Americans that he plans to use in exchange for his family. Boscom refuses and Cochise kills the prisoners. Boscom kills Cochise's family in retribution. The boy Felix Ward is now a member of the Coyotero tribe. He is now an Apache. This is the cause of a war that will last more than 25 years and cost countless lives. In day, settlers, Mexicans and Americans, soldiers and civilians alike. Late in the war, General Crook enlists the help of Apache scouts, Apaches who ally with the U.S. government to capture, quote, renegades, Apaches who refuse to stay within the boundaries of the now allocated concentration camps. Today, we call them reservations. The abducted young boy, Felix Ward, is now a young man. He is caught between worlds and cultures, multilingual, Mexican-Irish, raised Apache. He becomes one of Crook's scouts and adopts a new name, Mickey Free. It was chaos. Americans versus Apache. Apache versus Americans. Mexicans versus Americans. Americans versus Mexicans. Apache versus Mexicans. Mexicans versus Apache. Apache versus Apache. Apache versus the military. Everyone versus everyone. Nintendo, Danny, he the high clean, na? Nintendo, do. Welcome to another episode of In Range. You've made it to Arizona Territory, circa 1875, and that was a mistake because you're now embroiled in one of the worst conflicts on American soil that ever has occurred. I'm here representing some of the men that would have fought with the Nde or the Apache against the federal forces. A lot of people don't realize this, but whites fought with the Apaches, Apaches fought with the whites. There were Indian scouts, as Crook called them, that fought and helped find renegade Apaches. But there were also Americans or whites that integrated into Apache society and adopted some of their ways, and in some circumstances, fought with them. And that's what I'm representing today. Kevin here will be representing the 4th Cavalry, but the 4th, 6th, and 10th were active here in Arizona. We're going to go through the guns and gear of that. But so what I have here is a Springfield 1870 and the appropriate gear. But what we're going to do is walk you through what we're wearing because this is relevant to this video. And we're going to have shooting today demonstrating both of these on the clock. So why don't we go ahead and start off with our footwear, our boots. That yeah. sound good? Sounds good. All right. So I'm actually wearing, these are a legitimate a reproduction, of course, Apache boots. This is what about the end day typically would have wore. You see that they lace at the front like a stand, essentially a standard shoe. But then they can actually wrap up and then you tie leather around the top and you have essentially protection against choya, rocks, all the dangers of the desert. And this would be what you would call the fighting mode. You bring them up, tie them here, and that would protect your legs the most you could. When you were wearing them more casually, you would take this leather off and then fold them over. But Kevin, you got cavalry boots. Yeah, the U.S. government had so much surplus uh, Civil War stuff after the Civil War, obviously, that they were still issuing Civil War gear up till the mid 1870s. Starting in the mid 1870s, they started having dedicated upgraded gear. These are later model cavalry boots. They've got the extended upper to protect you when you're riding horses against the, you know, mesquite trees and bushes and everything else. And these are the standard issue spurs that they use because they, they needed to spur the horses, but they didn't want to hurt them. So they've got little rounded nubs on there. But these are pretty common of the era. So. Now, but your gear is designed pretty much to be for, for up to being mounted. Yes. And, and the Apache boots were designed to be on foot because yeah. the Apache were far more on foot than they ever were on horse. Yeah. And in fact, the Apache would beat the cavalry in terms of movement many on ground times. by foot. Yes, many, many times. There were situations in which they would find the renegades, that's the term they used at the time, not mine, and the cavalry couldn't follow them because the Apache, an entire family, women, children, and warriors yeah. would go up and over the mountain in a way that was almost inexplicable. And, 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 and impossible for a horse to follow them. Yep, too. and the cavalry. And the cavalry, these are the, the, the riding heels, so they're, they're good for riding, they're not as good for walking. Okay, <laughs> and then we get to pants. Now, I'm just wearing essentially what would have been, these are again another reproduction. A lot of times the Apache themselves would have been essentially bare-legged, but I'm not. I'm a white guy 
with the Apaches. So I'm wearing essentially jeans. These are really kind of not Levi's, but Levi types. And there are suspenders under this that hold them up, not a belt. But they are quite comfortable. And as you can see, baggy and very yeah. protective. Looks like you got wool. Yeah, these are, again, these are later post-Civil War. They're a little bit different construction, but they're still heavy gauge wool, mm. very thick, and they're very durable. In the winter, they're nice and warm. In the summer, they're not awful. They're, really? They're not as awful. After you wear them, you break them in, they're not quite as scratchy. Mm -hmm. And I can wear these all day and not be annoyed. And uh, Maybe if it's 120. Okay, fair. Because they're, they're, they're baggy. Anything that's baggy in the desert is better than tight because you get a little bit of airflow and it's, it's not so bad. A lot of people, when they watch in-range videos, think, how do you wear so much in yeah. the desert? And the reality yeah. is you actually want to wear more, not less. You want to cover every square inch of your skin in the desert. <laughs> and then we get the load-bearing kit here. And so back then you were essentially using bandoliers. And I would be pretty well healed in regards to the uh, Apache cause, although they did get a lot of weaponry and it was possible. But as a result, I pretty much have to deal with what I could find surplus. I'm not going to be issued anything by the government. So this would have been a, essentially a surplus style Civil War holster. However, I've got it in tan because of the desert heat. Got a bandolier holding my cartridges. These are 44 Henry Rimfire replicants. We'll get to the guns more in a minute. And I've got what you call a prairie belt, which is a cloth belt holding 50, 70 cartridges, which we're going to get to in a moment. But this is something I probably landed up scavenging, either buying or scavenging off someone that was dead. Yeah. You got government issue gear. Yeah, again, this is government issue. This is the early, the early leather gear. They started out with that because that's what they had and that's what they knew. And even though it's not quite Civil War, it's adapted from Civil War. Although this is a Civil War cat pouch and they, used, they, they tended to use these for pistol ammo. And a regular <clears throat> issue holster with the... Well, the issue Colt 45 in there. So, and then this is, a, I have a, it's kind of a modified, they had about 20 different styles of pouches to hold rifle ammo. And this one's kind of like a McKeever pouch, but it's not exactly. I've actually got pistol rounds in there and also it's got like more 45, 70 rounds in there. Um, so it was field expedient stuff out, mm -hmm. in the, out in the desert, in the Western and the frontier area. They got, they used what they got and what they could make. Well, it was there. I mean, the supply chain was strained and long. <clears throat> supply, can, the supply chain was uh, intermittent. I guess we could best we. Could oh no, say they it. weren't intermittent. The supply chain was stopped by um, and the hmm, Indians. Some, yeah. some of us, some the of us, <laughs> kind of cut those supply the chains natives, short. You know, cut the supplies short, and then I, of course, have the 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 Mills belt, which was an issue in starting in the 1870s. Uh, it was issued just. They they originally had leather cartridge belts for the rifles. And the pistol ammo, but then they learned early on that verdigris, which is corrosion on the brass, with the leather, with the chemicals used to tan the leather and everything, caused the brass to corrode, and then they wouldn't chamber in the rifle, in the pistol, or they would chamber, and then they wouldn't extract, and that caused all kinds of issues. And that doesn't take long to happen. If you're out yeah. in the desert heat and you're sweating on your leather belt with those brass cartridges in it, yeah. you will yeah. get that essentially brass rust. It's yeah. verdigris. It looks green, and that could absolutely prevent, it may not yeah. prevent insertion, but it might prevent extraction, extraction. which is even worse. Just as, yeah. So, so then you've also so, got a standard shirt there? Or the standard, yeah, this is the, the standard, it's a cotton, it's not a wool shirt. There were wool and there were some cotton ones, mm -hmm. but this is the pattern. This is the pattern that the army issued at the time frame, mm -hmm. and plain old cloth suspenders, which is what they had. The ones under my shirt you can't see are leather. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, leather was common, but the army. This is what the army issued. This mm -hmm. is exactly what they would issue. You time. got a hat and the hat. Yeah, the, they went through a multiple iterations of the hats, and again, up through the mid 1870s, they had standard leftover Civil War slouch hats and kepis. They usually used kepis in the in the garrison, you don't want a kepi out here in the sun. No. So they came up with this design, and it actually works pretty good. It's, it's lightweight, and it, it covers your face. And See, it's protecting it's, your eyes from the sun right now, in it fact. It is right now. And you've got the 4th Cav logo on there. 4th Cavalry, yeah, which was based at Fort Huachuca, Camp Huachuca at the time. <laughs> and then also the, the 6th Cavalry is involved, and the 9th and 10th, mm -hmm. mostly more the 9th and the 10th, but the, the Buffalo Soldiers. The 10th being famous for being Buffalo Soldiers, yeah. which were African Americans yeah. that, that essentially were brought into the Indian Wars. Yes. Yeah. Um, and now let's go ahead and go through the guns. So I'll start with mine and then we'll go with yours. Okay. So this is an 1870 Springfield. Now, a lot of you may not be aware of the 1870 Springfield. And again, there's a video on the channel that's more in depth on this. But an 1870 Springfield started off as an 1861 Springfield rifle musket for the most part. And there was something called the Allen's Conversion in which they cut out the rear and then added a lock plate, which was a toggle, essentially a, a trap door, and then sleeve the barrel to make it 50 caliber from the 58 caliber 
rifled musket. As that was in 1868, they eventually got to 1870, and that's what this model is, where they started making these directly, however, with some surplus parts. In fact, the lock plate on this is from 1861. The date on this is, this is an 1861 piece, and this is an original gun. And the reason I'm using this to represent the opposition is because they only use these for a short duration of time, from 1868 to 1870 in the cartridge 5070. Um, and what happened was they then decided to make the 1873 trapdoor chambered in 4570, ostensibly for better ballistics. And the 1870, 1868 Springfield all became immediate surplus, as did 5070 cartridges. Those all went on to the quote civilian market, and a significant number of these landed up in the hands of the opposition frontiersmen. Uh, Americans, whites, and indigenous forces, including the Apache. In fact, uh, the first time Geronimo surrendered, he surrendered a, this exact model rifle to uh, John Clum, which is a pretty fascinating story. Um, so, but that said, this is functionally the equivalent of a 1873 trapdoor, except it's rifle length. The big deficiency here are the sights. This has really bad trough sights. Other than that, it's kind of the equivalent. Now, you've got a cavalry gun. Yeah, this is the cavalry issued 1873, starting in about 1874, when they started issuing these. This is actually an Italian reproduction, but it's, it, it's a almost exact duplicate. And they were pretty handy. They're not very heavy, but, which causes excessive recoil, which are standard. The original 45 government was 45 caliber, 70 grains of powder. Well, they ended up changing it and coming up with a 45-55 just for the car carbines, which was only 55 grains of powder, which made a lot of difference in the recoil. And a different so, bullet weight, 405 yeah, grain 405 versus 500 versus government. 500, so a whole lot less recoil, because even with the, the standard weight cap, the carbine load on this is still a handful to shoot. So. Yep, and 50-70 I'm shooting is a 450 grain bullet with 70 grains of black powder. You can see them next to each other there. Yeah. So 4570 at the bottom and 5070 at the top. 5070, again, being a surplus round. It was a government issue for a short duration of time, but the Apache and a lot of people on the frontier were using 5070 because they could get it, and it became really common because of the surplus rifles. So that said, this is an original gun, as I said earlier. This one was actually made in 1870, and it's got interesting marks all over it. If you haven't seen the video about the gun, check that out. But at the same note, to have both a rifle and a pistol would be a pretty rare circumstance for uh, anyone on either side frequently, although the cavalry more well, so like than the, mine. The cavalry was issued handguns. But, but it does, it did happen. Anybody else. It did happen on both sides. But that said, I'm not going to have the coolest, newest 1873 single action army. Mm -hmm. So what I have is an 1871 open top. This is a, a Colt. It is a reproduction by Cimarron. But so what you saw is at the end of the Civil War, they started boring out the cylinders and making something called a Richard Mason's conversion, frequently chambered in 44 Henry rimfire, the same round as the, uh, 18, the, the Henry rifle and the later 1866 Winchester. But when they went from essentially converting original Colts, or excuse me, percussion Colts to cartridge Colts, they went to the 1871-72 open top and started making these directly. This is not a conversion. This was made in this guise. The big difference is there's no conversion ring and there's a rear sight here on the actual barrel, which is a better sight picture. Still chambered in 44 Henry rimfire, which is not a thing you can get today, but I have all of my cartridges I'm using today replicate the 44 Henry rimfire load with black powder. So a ballistically equivalent. That said, you were issued a rifle. A handgun. A handgun, yeah. excuse me. A handgun. Well, the infamous Colt 45, which everybody's known and heard about. And this is, a, again, Italian reproduction. This is a reproduction of what was issued to the cavalry troopers starting mm -hmm. in, in 1874. It's got the cartouches and everything. So, and, and the old infamous 45 Colt. So you have a much more potent cartridge. The 45 Colt yes. at that time would have been a 250 grain bullet. 250 grain bullet at right around 900 feet per second. Yeah, and 44 Henry rimfire out of this would be essentially a 200 grain bullet, moving at around 750, 800. Yeah. So not really that big of a deficiency. No, not really. But you got more power. Yeah, a little uh, bit more power. Yeah. You know, I don't think that we necessarily have a better sight picture, though. No, it's pretty much the same. This one, it has the, it has the old trough for the sight, and the, but it's got a little bit bigger post. You do have a bigger post, yeah, yeah blade. Hmm. So, what we're going to bring to you today is both Kevin and I are going to shoot this match, the two-gun action challenge match, with this very historic gear, all of it chambered in black powder. And we're going to give you an example, or a little taste of what it was to fight the Federals, or to fight as a like Federal. The indigenous. <laughs> uh, or those allied with the Indigenous. Yes. <laughs> um, in the 1870s. Yeah.
High right. Oh, yeah. I just had to aim. Right. Really? Yep. Whoa. Had you worked that out ahead of time? No, he worked that out on the. Hit! Okay. That's okay. Low. low. Like almost at the base of the target low. One out of two. How did Edwin manage to kill each other guys? Hit! You saw me except the end, I was hitting a lot. Huh? Uh, you know, let's, 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 you hear all this lore about people make, making hits at extreme ranges back then? It happened. But, like, wasn't that more of like. So that was like three, low, right? Yeah, and had little. specialized gear and extremely skilled people. Hit! And unlike today where you can compensate for bad eyesight, you probably haven't had a person. People who make those long shots in the UK are called Kinnair. You know, or, uh, or Kinnair you can dial in and you have to know the exact distance. I've got a Remington rolling block with one of these. Did I hit one over here? No, I did not. Where is it? I can't 
can't see it at all. A little to the left, I think. You're underneath of it, Carl. Am I? Yeah. I'm glad somebody can see it. Oh, I did that remote control. Oh, it's hot. Gun's really hot. That's it. Yahoo! 